It is now also my great privilege to be able to introduce our speaker for the morning, Reverend Gloria Elaine White Hammond is a graduate of Boston University, Tufts University School of Medicine, and Harvard Divinity School. She's a member of the boards of Brigham and Women's Hospital, Save Darfur Coalition, and Tufts University. Dr. White's, White Hammond's community service spans three decades and two continents. In 1994, she founded the church-based um, creative writing mentoring ministry, Do the Right Thing for High-Risk Adolescent Females. The project now serves 200 young women through small groups in Boston public schools, juvenile detention facilities, and on-site at Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Since 2001, Dr. White Hammond has made numerous trips into war-torn southern Sudan. Darfur and Chad. In 2002, she co-founded My Sister's Keeper, a women-led humanitarian and human rights initiative that partners with diverse Sudanese women in their efforts toward reconciliation and reconstruction of their communities. The group is deeply committed to three pathways to sustainable peace. The Sisterhood for Peace Initiative supports a growing network of diverse Sudanese women in Sudan and the diaspora who collaborate across traditional boundaries of race, religion, ethnicity, and geography to promote peace throughout Sudan. The Kunyuk School for Girls, a primary school lo located in Akon, um, South Sudan, began in 2003 with 100 girls. In 2008, MS Keeper completed the construction of the permanent campus for the school, now comprised of 550 students. 2007, Sisters Keeper launched the Women's Peace School and Adult Literacy Project, also in Akon, which supports 200 women. Now, Gloria's husband, Ray Hammond, is also a pastor and these two are wonderful partners in ministry. The pastors Hammond are cherished friends of Gordon Conwell and continue an active service in the great city of Boston. Please help me welcome to our pulpit this morning, the Reverend Gloria White Hammond. Thank you very, very much. It is a privilege to be here this morning. Now, um, Gordon told me that, um, that, I could, that, that there's really no time limit and I can talk as long as I want. <laughs> now, you know, that's a real challenge uh, for a black preacher, right? <laughs> so, uh, but I'm not going to take that, uh, that latitude. I'm going to uh, try to keep my comments to just a few minutes. Uh, it is really a privilege to be here. Wow, this is really exciting. This is my first time in your chapel. Um, as you know, many of our, as our people on our staff have been graduates of Gordon-Conwell, so we consider Gordon-Conwell to be a real friend and a supporter, and uh, thank you for the amazing work that you do uh, to support our ministry. Uh, I, I know that this is the beginning of the year, and I can imagine that for many of you, they're, they're, you're kind of thinking with great anticipation, but perhaps a little bit of angst as well. And so uh, I likewise am approaching the year feeling the same way, but there is a word from the Lord, and so I'm going to just, um, uh, just take a bit of a text, but I'm not going to preach today. So let the church say Amen. <laughs> so this is Psalm 24, and I'm going to start at verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? On um, May 29, 1953, um, Edmund Hillary and the Nepalese Sherpa Tenzang Norgay 
became the first climbers to summit the uh, 29,000 foot Mount Everest. For his work, uh, Hillary was named one of the uh, 100 most influential people of the 20th century. And since then, mountaineering has really become a sport. There are many people around the world who've taken up the sport of mountaineering. There have been thousands who have climbed Mount Everest, but only less than 30% of them have been successful. And I, I must say that over the last year, I've really been trying to reflect on what makes the difference between those who succeed and those who don't. Uh, and the major focus of this reflection is the fact that I was, uh, my husband and I were invited to uh, climb Kilimanjaro by a friend of ours and actually a congregate. Um, now, Kilimanjaro is 19,000 feet. It is the, the tallest mountain uh, in uh, Africa, freestanding mountain, not part of a range. And, you know, I must admit that I had trepidation. I certainly like climbing, but this was a really high mountain. And I'm so sorry my husband couldn't be here because my husband thought it was a great idea. <laughs> and, uh, and he just has a real kind of adventurous spirit around about him. He likes to scuba dive and you can see his eyes light up when he talks about getting like 150 feet below the surface of the ocean. Um, his eyes light up, but my heart starts to race because I don't swim. <laughs> so, um, so I said, you know, here, Ray Hammond is going to drag me into another adventure. Um, but I, I, I didn't, I, wanted my, I want to go and support my friend and didn't want my husband to go by himself. So I decided to take on Kilimanjaro with my husband. And we've certainly done some mountain climbing before. We've done Mount Washington, uh, which is 6,000 feet. But again, Kili is like three times as high as that. It's 19,000 feet. Um, and, and what we've come to realize when we went to the orientation is that Kilimanjaro, in a sense, is not technically difficult. It's not like you have to have ropes and do a whole lot of rappelling. But it does require endurance, and it does require perseverance. And the biggest challenge that people face, two big challenges. One is the altitude. Uh, because it's so high, many people, when they get above 10,000 feet, begin to experience what's called altitude sickness. And that, and that means there's a swelling of the brain, brain, there's fluid in the brain, there's fluid in the lungs. So people can be, develop headaches, de develop nausea, and a lot of trouble breathing because, of course, the air is so much thinner when you get up that high. Uh, and, the, and the challenge is that you really can't train in terms of the altitude. Uh, you can experience it, but you really, it's not like if you get used to 10,000 or you get used to 12,000, that ensures that you're going to be able to get up to 19,000. Um, so the one problem that people encounter is the altitude. Then the other thing that the people who are orienting us said, the next biggest problem is their attitude. And what they realize is that the people who can get up the mountains are the ones who really are steadfast and believe that they were going to make it up the mountain. Um, so we decided that we were going to navigate um, one of the Colorado mountains in the Rockies. And so we were going up a 12,000 foot mountain. And um, I, you know, I think I'm in reasonably good shape. I'm certainly in good shape for a woman my age. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so, I, so I, you know, I thought we could do this. And I should have known that we might be in a little bit of trouble because, you know, I, I, we're about, there's a, again, a 12,000 foot mountain and we were starting at around, uh, around 7,000. And somewhere around like eight or 9,000, I started to kind of, oh, oh, I don't know why I'm doing this. Why did you make me do this? Um, but we did make it up the mountain. And so I must admit that I left that mountain feeling um, certainly confident and maybe even just a little bit cocky um, because I knew that there were going to be other older women on the trip and I figured, well, I can, at least, I can at least do better than the other older women on the trip. And so um, we set off to Kilimanjaro. And when we arrived at the base camp, there was, it was just a beautiful, beautiful experience. We'd, I, we were in, our, um, in our, uh, our, our place where we were staying and woke up in the morning and there was an ostrich staring in the window. 
um, you can go outside and, and take walks, and there are zebras walking around, and and uh, and off in the distance we saw um, we saw a hippo uh, in the in the water. We saw a couple of elephants walking around. I mean, it's just really kind of magical, right? Right, like you know, Lion King kind of stuff. So um, you know, so this was going to be just a, such an exciting, exciting adventure. But I will say early on, I just had a little bit of apprehension and. And the major source of my apprehension at the time was, again, not so much the physical challenge, but um, my, my secret is, despite my very public persona, I am ex actually extremely shy. Um, and the secret is that I'm very much an introvert. And we were going to be going on this trip with, there were going to be, a, there was a party of 14 of us. And I certainly knew my friend, and I knew my husband, but the rest of them, 11 people, I didn't know who those people was. And, um, and of course, we were supposed to be in very close quarters. Um, you try to travel as a group, and at night along the way, you sleep in tents uh, and, and have meals together. And so it becomes a very communal experience. And, and our friend who coordinated the trip was really into kind of, you know, let's talk together. Let's find out about each other. <laughs> OK. And I'm like, you know what, honey? I just need to get up the mountain. <laughs> um, so we were gathered around on the night before we were supposed to leave. And, and so and the question was, what do you need to get up the mountain? Um, and people were supposed to share what they wanted from other people. And, um, and some people you know, said they needed, uh, they need to play music, and some people need a snack, and they came to my husband, and, and some people said they, you know, they wanted someone to talk with, and, and they came to my husband, and he said, he would talk to everybody. And then they came to me, and it's like, well, you know, actually, like, I'm kind of a solitary soldier, and so I don't want nobody to talk to me while I'm trying to get up the mountain. <laughs> um, so that, I thought that was really clear. And, uh, <laughs> and so we start on day one going up the mountain. And my prayer was, you know, God, I really don't want to be the laggard in this crew. Um, I, I, so I see all these other older women. I know I can, I, I don't want to be the laggard. And I kind of knew I was in trouble when on the first day I just sort of finished towards the end. Um, but, you know, that was just the first day. And the good thing is by the second day, I kind of found myself picking it up. And, and the third day, I sort of found myself lagging. And the fourth day, I was kind of picking up. But by the fifth day, and we do the, you do the ascent over seven days. That's one of the reasons why, with this particular group, they actually have a 95% finish rate. Overall, Kilimanjaro's finish rate is, uh, is about, um, about 65%. But theirs is so much better because they say they do it over nine days. And most people try to do it in five to seven days. So they really give you time to acclimatize. And they pointed out that they had a 70-year-old woman who made it up the hill. Well, I'm not seven. Honey, so if she can make it up, I know I can make it up. But I was, you know, I, I it was, I was kind of lagging a little bit, and um, and in the beginning, I, I I felt like more than anything, I was really contending with a sense of frustration because um, I, I I knew I could get it. I just sort of needed some time, but but I was really feeling frustrated that I just didn't seem to be keeping up with everybody. And one of the things that, uh, the classic term that you'll hear if you try to do Kilimanjaro uh, is in Swahili, the porters continue to t tell you pole, pole. And it means slowly, slowly. And so I started out trying to keep my pace with everybody else. And, and at one point, my porter said, stop. He said, this is how you do it. And he said, you have to go pole, pole. That the way to ensure that you climb up this mountain is to go pole, pole. So I needed to go slowly, which was somewhat reassuring. But by the time we got to the fifth day, I knew, and it was the seventh, seventh day was when we were supposed to summit, I, I knew I was really in trouble. 
And you know how you have the sense that you know, people are looking at you and they're, I knew that behind the scenes they were taking bets, making bets as to whether or not I was going to be able to pull this off. And everybody was very kind, but I, I was very clear that that was probably going on. And in fact, at that point, I felt myself starting to be afraid. Um, the one thing that was remarkable that was on the fifth night, I, I thought, well, I, I can kick in here and do this, is because um, the person who was the head of our party, she fell. And the reason that she wanted to do this, she had bilateral knee replacements, and part of her encouragement for getting better was to take on Kilimanjaro. So that's why she'd organized the trip. And when she fell, her, her incision that over one of her knees, it opened. And she was sort of, kind of she didn't say anything until uh, we were, it was just myself and her and, and Ray. And, um, and he looked at it, you know, as you, we're both physicians. Uh, Ray is actually trained as an emergency room, for, uh, trained as a surgeon, then it went into emergency room medicine and stopped practicing uh, once we started the church. I said, I, I married my husband for richer or poorer. I entered into this marriage for richer, and I, obviously with him being a pastor, now I'm leaving this world being poor. Um, <laughs> but he knew how to do that. And, and the problem was, there, was there, were no, there were no surgical kits. There were no, there, I mean, there were no, like, there was nothing to, to do. So what was amazing was everybody kind of took their kits. He said he'd sew it up. With, and um, I do cross stitch, so I had a cross stitch project going. So I, I, I took out my needle. Somebody else does quilting, and so she had some thread, and she put together her thread. We all went through all of our, you know, EMS emergency kits. Uh, ours we bought in 2001 when we took our first trip to uh, Sudan, and there were a pair of sterile gloves and sterile drapes. And somebody else had some tweezers, and, and, and somebody else um, uh, used, a, used a flashlight. And we boiled the, the, the needle and the, the, the thread, and, and he sutured her. Um, and without any anesthesia, um, so someone held her. I mean, this, this, this is a brave sister. I'm telling this is a brave sister. And so somebody held her, and all she wanted was for people to sing hymns. Now, this is a mixed group. Here's, the, here's the, the, the Jew, the, the Muslim, and the Christian. We were the choir. And I'm leading through, through these old hymns, like bringing in the sheaves, right? And, and that was her anesthesia. And so he sewed her up successfully. And I said, I know I'm going to beat her up the mountain. <laughs> But lo and behold, the next day, I was still at the inn. And Ray was so wonderful, because um, he sort of stayed behind. And, um, and as I was struggling up the mountain, it was just me and my porters and Ray. And, and I'll never forget um, how tender he was, as he, he stayed behind and sang hymns to me. And as I confessed that I was afraid, um, that I was afraid I wouldn't be able to do this, that everybody knew that we were doing this, and I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to pull it off. And he was, he so tenderly sang all those old hymns. I'm not talking about Kirk Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, onward Christian soldiers, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. And so he sang us uh, for the next leg of the journey. So now we're at the final day. And... Um, they have us all start out as a group. Uh, it is, we're, we're very close to the summit now, and it is freezing. Um, and one thing I don't do is cold weather. I still don't know why I'm living in New England. But um, so this was, it was clearly, it was very, very cold. We were open, when we got up in the morning, the, it was in, uh, it, the temperature was in the teens. Um, and because they wanted to ensure that whoever could could get up the mountain, they just encouraged him to go ahead on. And so it was just me and my porters, uh, pretty much for the whole way. And, um, uh, and it was really hard. Um, and, I, and I found myself really wrestling with God and looking up to the top of this mountain and just being so intimidated. And I said, God, you know, I don't, I don't think that I could do this. He said, Gloria, take your eyes off of the mountain. Can you put one foot in front of the other? 
So you just think about one foot. Okay, I did it. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And so now, and that was the way I made it up as we got closer to the mountain. But we were about a thousand feet away, not so much in, in altitude, but in, just in terms of the distance. And I felt like I just, I, I can't, I really, I, can't, I don't think I can do this. And so the porters, each one of them took me by the arm and kind of lifted my weight off of me enough to allow me to just climb the rest of the way. And the Lord said, you know, when you feel like you're all alone and you can't make it by yourself, I'll send you angels. And the angels will help you make it up the rest of the way. And so, as I saw other people coming down, I, I made it to the top. Amen. And so, this is my certificate. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and it has my name on it. <laughs> And I was the last one in, and everybody was having dinner, and it was just almost nighttime by the time I got down. But I made it up. And so God's, it's really true, the race really is not given to the swiftest. It's given to those of us who endure. And so we all have mountains that we're climbing. Um, and they just seem so daunting, and at times overwhelming. And we wonder why God sent us out here all by ourselves. And sometimes it's just a really slow pace. And there's a wish that you could just go fast, but sometimes it's just pole, pole. And I'm convinced that some of the most important achievements that our world has ever known, um, some of the most miraculous ways that God has worked are the ones that we were done pole, pole. The civil rights movement, it was pole, pole. Defeating apartheid, a pole, pole experience. And so many of the experiences in our lives, personally, it's just slow going. And when you think that you can't do it, sometimes he'll send people along to come alongside and kind of give you words of encouragement and sing you up the way. But sometimes you have to go by yourself. Sometimes the last leg of the journey, you got to go by yourself. But you'll look around and discover God still has his angels and he carries us along the way. So I thank you so much for helping me process, this is the first time I've talked about this, <laughs> process this journey. And I certainly want to encourage you in your efforts as you ascend the hills. May God give you peace. May God give you grace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.